Our passage is from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written... For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks, Nikki. Um... Well, good morning, church. Uh, I am so glad to be with you this morning. In fact, I am joyful to be here with you. I say that knowing that so many of us are going through difficult situations. As I look around, I'm reminded of the difficulty that 2020 has been for all of us. I see faces of friends that have lost jobs, friends that have lost family members, Canceled trips, strained relationships, loneliness, separation from family, uh, family members due to COVID, uncertainty, and so many other trials. You may feel tired, exhausted, drained, confused, anxious, worried, or just plain blah. I mean, I get it. For me, this week alone consisted of a backed up sewer main, a few nights in a hotel, and a broken washing machine. I'm feeling it. So, but in this time of uncertainty, is there anywhere that we can go? Is there anything we can confidently hold to while the world around us falls apart? How do we know that God will do what he has promised when everything seems out of control? When everything is screaming at us that God is not for us, how do we know that he is? See, or maybe you're in here and you have a sin that you can't seem to defeat. You see victory over it for a few days. And then you sink back into it. You know you hate your sin, but you can't quite shake it. You start to wonder if God still loves you. You wonder if you could out the reach of his forgiveness. Well, in our passage today, we are going to see what Paul reminds the Romans of when these questions come into their mind. Paul doesn't tell them they just need to get it together and act like a Christian. He doesn't tell them they need to pretend like nothing is happening. He doesn't tell them they they are wrong to grieve. No. Instead, he gives them assurance of their position with the Father through Jesus Christ. See, and this assurance isn't just for the Romans, but it is for all of us who are in Christ. My prayer for you today is that you would believe this assurance. This is a life-changing assurance. Christ has given you all that you need. Oh, that we would fall more in love with Christ as we think on the truths of this text. So with that, let's get started. So Paul begins this assurance with a question in verse 31. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Well, this question is a response to everything he has just written to the Romans. In light of everything that he has just written, what conclusion can be made? What does all of this mean? Well, before we can answer that question, we have to look back on everything Paul is referencing. In chapter 5, he wrote, All who are in Jesus Christ are now at peace with God because Christ took the wrath they deserved on himself. Not only that, Christ is the new Adam, bringing bringing life, 
not death, to all are in him. Chapter 6, because of the work of Christ, Christians are no longer slaves to sin. They are slaves to righteousness. Chapter 7, they have died to the law through Jesus Christ so that they may belong to another. Chapter 8, because of the work of Christ, those who are in him are empowered by the Spirit to kill sin, have been made an heir with Christ. One day we'll see all creation made new, and the Spirit is interceding for them now as they wait for their glorified body. That's what these things mean. And this is really good news. This is amazing news. Those in my DC would say that this hope is dope. The right response isn't just, what then shall we say to these things? You know, like ho-hum. No, the proper response is, what then shall we say to these things? It's almost as if Paul cannot contain himself as he reaches the pinnacle of this beautiful crescendo of, of Romans 5 through 8. And his response to all that he has written is one massive life-changing assurance for us today because of the work of Christ. You'll see this on your handout. Here's our assurance. We have assurance that God is for us because of Christ. The rest of verse 31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? This is really a rhetorical question. The answer is implied that no one can truly be against us if God is for us. But if See, what, Paul, what does Paul mean here by if? Paul could have simply stated that God is for us and no one can be against us. But the if is significant. This question is the climax of everything Paul has just shared. Everything that he has written up to this point leads to this question. Paul is making an important distinction that God is not for everyone. And see, that isn't really what the world believes, though. I mean... God is thanked in countless award speeches for athletes and entertainers. Instagram posts are full of hashtag blessed on the end. Many Americans believe that God is for America, that this is his country. See, but that is not what Paul is teaching. See, you might think he is for you because you are a good person. You might think he is for you because you were baptized when you were seven. But the Bible teaches God is only for those who have put their hope in Jesus Christ. Those who have seen the penalty that they deserved for their sin was death. Those who have turned from their sin and have turned to Christ. We will see in a minute, but every assurance that Paul is about to unpack is hinged on Christ. If you have not placed your hope in Christ as the only one who can satisfy the wrath you deserve for your sin, I love you. But these assurances are not for you. If you haven't done this, please turn to Christ. You may have entered this room as an enemy of God, but you can leave with the assurance that God is for you because of Jesus Christ. So for those of you that have turned to Christ, the question then is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, Paul's question doesn't mean that people can't be against you. I mean, this doesn't mean that circumstances can't seem to be against you, but this does mean that if the God of all creation, the God who is reigning and ruling over all creation, the God who is perfectly just, merciful, and kind, the God who is infinitely wise and powerful, if that God is for you, then no one can really be against you. If you're unjust, limited in power, subjected to the king, boss, is against you, are they really against you? If you are sick, or feeling the effects of COVID on the world, are these really against you? No. God the Father is for you. He is in your corner. Do you think this virus can measure up to him? No. It's puny. It's weak. It's insignificant compared to him. Compared to the king who is infinitely for you, nothing can be against you. Man, this changes everything in the life of a believer. Like every day when you wake up, God is for you. Every evening when you go to bed, God is for you. Every time you move to a new place, God is for you. Every time you begin a new stage of life, God is for you. There is no reason to fear the unknown. God is for you. Nothing that has come, is here now, or will come compares to his matchless beauty, his matchless worth, and his matchless love. I mean, and this sounds great, 
If God is for me, then nothing can be against me. But how do I know that he is for me? Like, how can I have assurance that he will always be for me? Will he ever stop being for me? Like, has he been for me in 2020? Well, great questions. And Paul wants the Romans to know that this isn't, that this isn't just a lofty hope. That knowing that nothing can be against us is more than a cool hashtag we can throw on the end of a post. Hashtag nothing can be against me. No, Paul gives the Romans assurance that God is for them. And this assurance is real. This assurance is true. This, a true, this assurance is sure. This assurance gives real hope for us today. So check verse 32. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If you want to be sure that God is in your, your corner, don't look around. If you want to know without a doubt that he is in your corner, look to Christ. God did not withhold his son, the one that he loved, the one that he enjoyed perfect fellowship with from the beginning of time, the one that he is well pleased with. He did not withhold him from you. He gave him up for you. He did not give you his son out of obligation or compulsion or responsibility. He gave up his son because of his mercy. He gave up his son willingly. He gave up his son freely. And this is the assurance that we have. For all that are in Christ, God is for you, not because of what you have done, not because of what you are doing, and not because of what you are going to do. We know God is for us because he did not withhold his son from us. And if he did not withhold his son, why would he withhold anything from you? See, if he has given this massive gift, why would he not withhold anything from you? Your greatest need has been met in Christ. You were once under the condemnation of your sin. You were found guilty before a holy and righteous God. You had an eternal death sentence that you could not escape. If God gave you his son while you were his enemy, how much more will he give you now? See, but we have to ask a question. What will he give you? I mean, what are all these things that Paul is talking about in verse 32? Well, we're not talking about mansions or luxury cars, a fat bank account, an A on your final, health, a spouse, or even a normal family. We are talking about something so much better. See, if God did not withhold his son, we have assurance he will fulfill the promises that he has made to us. To say it another way, when you turn to Christ, everything you hope in Christ for really will come to pass because God has already given you his best, his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your assurance that God is for you to execute all of his promises to you. So think back on the last chapters of Romans. Because God gave his son, we have assurance that we really are now at peace with God. We have assurance that we really will experience eternal life. We have assurance that we really are dead to sin and slaves now to righteousness. We have assurance that we really are released from the law. We have assurance that we really are heirs with Christ. We have assurance that all creation will one day be made new. We have assurance that we really will be given glorified bodies. We have assurance that the Spirit really is interceding for us. Man, and these are just some of the promises in Romans 5 through 8. You have 65 other books full of promises that have been assured for us through the work of Christ and the gift of him to all who trust in him. See, in these promises... They give us hope for today. This assurance changes our life right now. Think about it. I mean, if God is for you and he will never stop being for you, then do you need the approval of your friends? If God is for you now and he will never stop being for you, then you need to hoard your money rather than give it away. What about singleness? The God of the whole universe is for you. <laughs> Nothing can compare to him. As great as marriage is, a spouse will never compare to him. See, God is infinitely for you if you are in his son. This will never change. God will never stop being for you. You do not have to live for anyone or anything other than him. See, nothing can change your status in God because of Christ. See, if you wonder whether this is true, 
Paul is about to walk through two extreme examples to confirm that our hope is real. Our hope is secure. Our hope will never change. We have confirmation that our hope will never change because first, it's on your handout, it says, God is for us in spite of our sin because of the work of Christ. Verse 33, here comes another rhetorical question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? The question of who are God's elect is a sermon for another day. It's not the emphasis of this passage, and actually John addressed that last week in his sermon. But it is clear from the context that God is for his elect. Paul is addressing this, addressing this question to a specific group of people. Can anyone bring any accusation against God's elect? Could there be anything that will change God's opinion of his elect? See, this isn't just a random question. This question is specifically asked. If anyone could bring a charge against God's elect, it would change everything. There would no longer be assurance that God is for his elect. There would be no assurance that he will fulfill his promises. This is a huge question. If any sin can change God's standing with his elect, then the gospel is no longer good news. And your assurance that God for, is for you is destroyed. So to word Paul's question just a slightly different way. Can anyone bring a charge against God's elect that will shake their assurance? Paul's answer. It is God who justifies. God is the one who forgives and gives the verdict of righteous. He is the one, the only one, that can effectively justify and declare you as righteous. Just like we discussed earlier, it is not that no one can bring a charge against God's elect. Satan will bring charges against you. Just like he whispered to Eve in the garden, he will whisper lies and accusations to you. He, rem- he may remind you of the argument you got in re- with your spouse last week. He may remind you of the lie you told your friends to make yourself look good. He may bring doubts into your head that God is no longer for you. When you hear those whispers from Satan, remember He isn't the one who justifies you. God is the one who justifies you. All your blemishes might be exposed by a coworker. A family member might remind you of all of your failures. Your friend might harbor bitterness against you. But remember that God is the one who justifies. See, if God declares you righteous, if God declares you justified, can anyone change that verdict? Can anyone find enough evidence against you to change God's verdict? Is there any judgment against you that can override the sovereign kings? See, if God has declared you as righteous, no one can change that verdict. No one. And how has God declared you righteous? More importantly, how do you have assurance that you have been declared righteous, which ultimately assures you that God is for you? Verse 34, it says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Brothers and sisters, you have assurance that you have been declared righteous by God because of Jesus Christ. In this verse, we see four reasons that because of Jesus, we have assurance that we have been justified by God. First, We have assurance that we are declared justified because Jesus died in our place. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. So who could possibly condemn you? Your sin has already been condemned on Christ. All your sin that you have committed and that you will commit for the rest of your life was put on Christ when you turned to him. You deserved death. You deserved the guilty sentence. But Christ died in your place. Only because of the work of Christ are you declared righteous. He was the one who lived perfectly. You are declared righteous because of him. He, was, he wasn't just a little bit perfect. He was completely perfect. Your sin wasn't just mostly put on him. It was completely put on him. Your sin was completely judged in Christ. God declares you righteous because of the work of Christ. He died in your place. Second, we have assurance that we are declared justified because Jesus defeated our biggest enemies, sin and death. See, it says Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. 
See, Christ didn't just die. He was raised. He accomplished victory over sin and death. The condemnation for your sin did not defeat Jesus. He defeated sin and death. He is victorious. He has secured God pro- God's promises for you in his victory over sin and death. Third, we have assurance that we are declared justified because Jesus is ruling now. It is Jesus who is at the right hand of God. He is right now at the right hand of God. Right now, Jesus has been exalted above all things. Right now, he is ruling over all things. Right now, he is caring for you. Right now, he is loving you. Nothing can happen, is happening, or has happened that he has not allowed to happen. Nothing that can happen, is happening, or has happened will remove him from seating at the right hand of God. The one who has died in your place, the one who has raised defeating sin and death, is caring for you now. He will not allow anything to happen to you that will change your status with God. Fourth, we have assurance that we are declared justified because Jesus' blood is sufficient. See, it says Jesus is the one who indeed is interceding for us. He is petitioning on your behalf. Any charge that could be brought against you is overruled on the basis of his blood. No matter the evidence against you, Christ's blood is sufficient to cover all your sins. So who can bring any charge against God's elect? What about last night when you were jealous of all the relationships that your friend has? What about the other day when you snapped at your kids? What about last week when you lied to your employer? You really are guilty. What if Satan brought those charges against you? Would he be able to change God's verdict of justified? See, God's verdict of justified will not change no matter the evidence against you. Your accuser can bring in video evidence, expert witnesses, DNA samples. It doesn't matter. All evidence will be overruled by the superior evidence, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is the only defense you need against your accuser. Not only is it the only defense you need if you are truly in him, you cannot out the blood of Christ. Nothing you do will ever be greater than what he has already done on your behalf. The blood of Christ is sufficient to cover all your sins. You are declared justified on the basis of Christ's blood. So, but why does all that matter? In verse 33, Paul asks, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? We've just talked about it. No one. God will never declare you guilty. He, Christ was guilty in your place. For all of eternity, you are declared innocent if you are in Christ Jesus. See, and this is huge. You do not need to live in fear that God will change his mind about you. God will always be for you. He will always be on your side. He will accomplish all of his promises for you. See, and this also means that there's no reason to hide your sin. You may feel guilt, you may feel shame, but you are declared righteous forever. So you don't have to be like David when he hid his sin in Psalm 32, 1. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. You can freely confess your sin. You can experience the joy of being forgiven. If God has declared you as righteous, you are righteous forever. Bring your sin into the light and run from it. Christ died to give you freedom from that sin. And while we are here on earth, God has given you brothers and sisters that are filled with the Holy Spirit to walk this journey with you. See, God has given them to pray for you, to remind you of truth, to encourage you to love Jesus more than the world. You do not need to silently wrestle with the despair of your sin on your own. You can freely confess your sin one to another. If you are in Christ, That sin has been forgiven. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are not your enemies waiting to heap accusations on you, waiting to drag your name through the mud. They are a gift to you from God for your good. See, now I know for some of you that is hard to hear. You have been stabbed in the back by so-called Christians. You have experienced the condescension and pride from others as you opened up about your sin struggles in the past. If that is you, first, I am sorry. 
Like, that is not the way God designed his church. He did not make his body to function that way. But second, do not let the sins of the people in your past rob you from the freedom and joy of confessing your sins to your brothers and sisters now. Confidently confess your sins to your brothers and sisters, knowing that they have been forgiven to the utmost by the one who justifies through Christ Jesus. So we have confidence that God is for us in spite of our sin because of the work of Christ. But not only that, and you'll see this on your handout, we have confidence that God is for us through our sufferings because of the love of Christ. Verse 34, another question from Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, Paul isn't asking if we will ever stop loving Christ. I mean, be assured, there will be days when your affections for Jesus grow cold. But Paul is driving, what Paul is driving at here is could anything or anyone separate us from Christ's love for us? Could Christ ever stop loving us? All of the promises of God are secured for us through the work of Christ. But could there ever be a day when Christ stopped loving us? If anything could change our status with Christ, then the gospel would cease to be good news. Do we have assurance that Christ will love us today and forevermore, no matter what happens to us? See, what follows is a series of hypothetical questions. Shall any of these things that Paul's about to list successfully separate us from the love of Christ? Could tribulation separate you from the love of Christ? Could distress separate you from the love of Christ? Persecution, famine, nakedness, or any level of poverty? What about danger? Or the sword, or as intended to convey here, death by the sword? And we could just keep going and adding to this list. What about a loss of a job, death of a spouse, fractured relationships, unexpected household repairs, social isolation, canceled graduations, postponed weddings? If you were to face any of these perils, would they successfully separate you from the love of Christ? See, but Paul doesn't simply leave this in the hypothetical. He quotes Psalm 44, 22. He says, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. See, Paul isn't just talking about one day when the Romans face persecution. He isn't just talking about one day when they are faced with distress or famine or danger or even death. For the Lord's sake, these things are happening to them now. Right now, the Romans are experiencing these things. They really are feeling the pain and sorrow from the realities of life. This isn't just a philosophical question anymore. This is real life. Man, and I know that this is true for so many of you here today. You feel the tribulation of cancer or babies that won't sleep through the night. You feel the distress of severed relationships or unknowns from COVID. You feel the persecution of mockery by coworkers or family members for what you believe. You feel the weight of financial unknown. As a church, we are not immune to the difficulties of this world. Some difficulties at the hand of Satan as he aims to steal our joy in Christ, and some just as a result of living in this fallen world. The feelings that you have are real. The pain you are dealing with is real. The unknown is real. But can they separate you from the love of Christ? No. And here's why. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, the aim of Satan in all the difficulties of life is to separate us from the love of Christ. But he will not succeed. Through Christ Jesus, him who loved us, we are more than conquerors. The aim of the enemy in all of the calamities and hardships that you face is to separate you from the Christ love. If you are in Christ, no matter what you face, no matter the level, level of difficulty, whether a one or a ten, no matter the level of pain, you are still infinitely loved by Christ. Every fiery dart unleashed will be thwarted. See, but the text doesn't just say we are conquerors. No, it says we are more than conquerors. So what does this mean? What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? In his book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper has this to say about being more than conquerors. So, but what does it, ah, 
But what must happen in this conflict with famine and sword if you were to be called more than a conqueror? One biblical answer is that a conqueror defeats his enemy. But one who is more than a conqueror subjugates his enemy. A conqueror nullifies the purpose of his enemy. One who is more than a conqueror makes the enemy serve his own purposes. A conqueror strikes down his foe. One who is more than a conqueror makes his foe his slave. That means that all the pain you feel, all the snide remarks for Christ's name, all the despair and heartache, all the physical ailments you experience will never separate you from Christ. But more than that, all of your afflictions are turned to serve the purposes of Christ. He owns them. He is using them for his glory, for his sake. We are experiencing suffering. The aim of this affliction was to cause doubt in you. But Christ is turning those attacks against themselves right now. Instead of causing doubt, those attacks are now magnifying Christ in you. Instead of questioning Christ's love, your assurance in his love grows stronger through suffering. Through your suffering, he is taking your eyes off of this world and placing them on himself. The security you have in this world is nothing compared to him. The joy you have in this world is nothing compared to him. He is the superior hope, the superior love, and the superior treasure. If you were to lose everything in your life, everything this world has to offer, if you lost your job, your home, your health, your spouse, your parents, your children, your savings account, you have not lost Christ. In your suffering, in your pain, he loves you. He will never stop loving you. All the devil's attacks are unleashed for your harm. Christ turns all of them, every last one, into your good. Though the pain is real, though the disappointment is real, you have nothing to fear. Christ loves you. He is turning all of your pain into your good. And see, this is Paul's point in verses 38 through 39. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, this is total victory. God will never stop loving you because you are loved by, by Christ. Nothing can separate you from God's love. You have nothing to fear. You are God's holy and securely. Praise God. See, if you are in Christ, this is who you are. You are not defined by your circumstances. You are not a victim. No matter how real the pain is, no matter how intense the affliction is, you are defined by Christ's love for you. He is taking all of your struggles and turning them into your good. He is turning you to him. See, and this has massive implications on our lives. I mean, think about it. See, God did not give you assurance that he loves you so that when life is overwhelming, you can run to pornography to numb your stress and sin. He gave you assurance that when you're overwhelmed, you can cling to him as your great comforter and find peace in his love. God did not give you assurance that he loves you so that when your kids are out of control, you could run to social media to block it out. He gave you assurance so you can drink from the living water that gives all wisdom and all endurance to navigate the difficulties of life biblically. God did not give you assurance that he loves you so that when COVID changes your entire life, you can run to entertainment or food or alcohol or unhealthy relationships. He gave you assurance so that you can run to him as the solid, unchanging rock who sanctifies and satisfies in trials. God gave you assurance that he loves you so that in all these things, you can run to Christ. See, if we miss this, we miss being pruned into his image. We miss having our dead branches cut off so we can bear more fruit. We miss this sanctification that makes us more into his image. We miss being made holy as he is holy. If we run to the wrong things, we miss the purpose of suffering and the blessing that comes from suffering well. Speaking of suffering well, Adoniram Judson, a pioneer American missionary to Burma in the 1800s, had this to say about suffering. 
He said, if I had not felt certain that every trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. For those of you here who are not familiar with Adoniram Judson, he knew suffering well. He was married three times. His first two wives died from sickness in the Burmese jungle. He buried seven of his 13 children due to the harsh conditions in which they lived. He was imprisoned for 17 months on charges of espionage. After 12 years of faithfully preaching the word, he had just a handful of, con- handful of converts. So what sustained him? See, he was secure in the love of Christ. He knew that every trial he faced was orchestrated by infinite love and mercy. In the midst of the sorrow of bearing yet another child, he knew that God loved him. As he was hung up by his feet at night in prison, God loved him. Nothing could ever take God away from him. He was loved by the Father and the Son. See, today, the devil aims to steal your joy and security in Christ, but Christ will not allow that. Christ owns all the suffering that you experience. When affliction comes, when distress comes, danger, poverty, persecution, our response through Jesus Christ should be praise God that you love me so much. You are taking my eyes off of this world and placing them on you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being all that I need. Thank you for satisfying me. Thank you for caring for me in my pain. Through Christ, God will never stop loving you. You have confidence that he will always be for you, even through suffering. Church, you have assurance that he is for you. And because he is for you, all of his promises to you are sure. You have nothing to fear. You have confidence that he is for you in spite of your sin because of the work of Christ. You have confidence that he is for you through your suffering because of the love of Christ. And see, and it's in light of all that we've talked about today, in light of this assurance that we have, just here are three things I want you to consider as you leave here. First, tell others this good news. If you believe that God is for you, then how can you keep this to yourself? He gave you his son. All of his promises for you are secure. You have hope in the midst of a global pandemic or anything else this world can throw at you. This morning, we heard three people proclaim this good news as they were baptized. Man, this is really good news that we cannot keep to ourselves. And so what about your neighbor? What about your coworker? I mean, they have felt the same pain and suffering as you this year. Many of them, without the assurance that God is for them, they are separated from God because of their sin. Tell them this good news. They can be reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. Whether they listen to you or not, God is glorified in your obedience and know that your future is secure no matter the response you get. But what about those outside of the U.S. borders? I mean, this has been a global pandemic. According to the Joshua Project, a missions research organization, 2.17 billion people have virtually no exposure to this good news, meaning they will live their whole lives and potentially never meet a Christian. They will never have the opportunity to hear this good news. See, that is roughly 28% of the global population. They are suffering and have no assurance of hope. They have not heard the good news that Christ died for the sin and they can be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. To get a little more specific, a couple months ago we had Michelle and Rachel in our home to share about their time in North Africa. The country they were serving in has been hit hard by COVID. Tourism, one of their major industries, has been decimated. On top of that, their agriculture is suffering from drought. See, most people in this country believe that their only hope is that on Judgment Day, their good deeds will outnumber their bad. They have never heard that there is a God who sent his son to take, the judgment upon their, to take their judgment upon himself. And through this son, this father will love to the uttermost all who put their trust in him. So we must get this message to them. God's glory demands it. Second thing to consider for today man, we must love each other humbly. See, if you are a member of Cross Fellowship, here in a minute, 
you will affirm your covenant with your brothers and sisters to love them humbly. And loving one another humbly is an outpouring of the love that you have in God. If you think about it, if nothing will separate you from the love of Christ, then how can anything separate you from his bride? Nothing should. Whether anti-mask or pro-mask, Democrat or Republican, introvert or extrovert, whether, whatever you can list pales in comparison to what you have in common, the love of Christ. Live like this matters. Love each other humbly in spite of your differences. God loves you in Christ Jesus. He is for you. Love your brothers and sisters. Be for them, not against them. But also look to the physical needs of the body. In many ways, you are the means by which your brothers and sisters feel his love and their suffering. Third, and I, yeah, this has really all been about Jesus today. Third, run to Jesus. See, when calamity comes, run to Jesus. When hardship comes, run to Jesus. When life doesn't make sense, run to Jesus. When everything is good, run to Jesus. Because of Jesus, God is infinitely for you. You don't need a vacation or a day off. You don't need coffee. You don't need 2020 to end. The date of the calendar won't suddenly change your trials. You need Jesus. Through Jesus, the Father has given you everything you need. He has declared you as righteous. He loves you. In the midst of difficulty, when the world is swirling out of control, run to him. God will shelter you. He will protect you. He is for you. He is for you, church. He did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for you. Every promise you read from Genesis to Revelation is secure for you because of Jesus. No sin can change your declaration of righteous. No calamity, no pain, no suffering can ever separate you from the love of Christ. Church, let us live like this is true. Let's pray. Father, man, thank you for Jesus. God, without him, we would be separated from you, Lord. We would have no right to say that you are for us. God, but because of Jesus, because he has taken our wrath upon himself, because you have given him to us, Lord, we have assurance that you are for us. We have assurance that nothing will ever change that, our relationship with you, God. Lord, I pray that we would believe this. I pray that we would live like this is true. God, we have nothing to fear. We have no need to worry about tomorrow. God, our, our future is secure. It is 100% guaranteed because of the blood of Christ. It is 100% guaranteed because you've already given us your best, Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you for him. Father, I pray this in your name. Amen.